of God. What's a name? In days of old, biblical names had an impact on who the person was that had that name. You remember Isaac, son of laughter. Well, that's because Sarah laughed in the tent when the angel of God told Abraham, you're going to have a baby, and they were she's 90 years old. And of course, you would laugh if you lived to be that old. But that name was given to Isaac, son of laughter. What is the name that God is giving himself? Who names God? He names himself, and he tells us today his name. And let's look at this. We're reading in chapter 3 of uh, Exodus uh, 13 through 15. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's almost kind of funny. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord I am. The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So Moses now <clears throat> gives God a hypothetical. He said, what if, what if, God, I go to Israel and they ask me, who about your name? Who sent me? What is the name of the God who sent me? Sent me? What shall I say to them? And God answers powerfully. And it's almost a rebuke, and it's almost kind of funny. I am who I am. Now, <clears throat> he repeats this name, and this really isn't, <clears throat> excuse me, God's name. I mean, I am who I am. I sometimes think that is his name, but he says, I am who I am. There's a personal pronoun in between those two Yahwehs. And he's answering the question, and he's pointing to his name that he's going to give him in the very next word. I am who I am. But can you see that? I am who I am. Have you ever said that? People say, why do you keep doing that? Why do you, why do you not clean the house as much and you never dust the baseboards? And I say, I am who I am. You know, I mean, seriously, me dust baseboards? I mean, seriously. I mean, I guess I could. I would if you really pushed me. But God said, I am who I am. <clears throat> and then his name is in the very next word. Say this to the people, he says. The next word's out of God's mouth. He says, I am. You say to Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am <clears throat> is a, a wonderful word. It's an interesting word. It's a simple word. In the Hebrew um, language, it's, it's haya. You know, it means to be. To be or not to be. That is the question. To be. To be is that verb, or is, or exists. And it is used, so Yahweh adds a little beginning to that, that word that points to first person singular I, and the little vob in the middle there helps that verb to uh, be either a, in, a, in a certain verb tense or even a future verb tense. And so the verb to be, is I am with those little additions. I am. That same verb also, <clears throat> and this is interesting, in verse 12, um, he says, I will be with you. We did that last week. I will be with you. That's the exact Yahweh. 
because this verb can be in the present tense or the future tense. And so it is written exactly the same. And so that means when God says to Joshua, I will be with you, he's saying Yahweh, Yahweh. But it's in a future tense, I will be with you. And it also is in the present tense, I am. Same exact verb, same marks on the words. It can be I will be with you or I am. Some people <clears throat> interpret that, and you've probably heard that. I will be who I will be. You know, you may have heard that, and that is a legitimate interpretation. But I think I am <clears throat> is more powerful because I will be almost says, like in the future, I'm going to be. I am says, I am. So that is the name of Yahweh. And he says, this will be my name forever. You will remember this through all generations. This is my name. Tony alluded to this. Jewish people, <clears throat> devout Orthodox Jews, <clears throat> will not still not say Yahweh out loud. Except when they're reading the Torah, when they're reading, or when they're in the synagogue and praying. But they also will not even write it. I was looking on some sites, and they'll put, when they write God, they put G dash D. They won't even write God on their on the on a piece of paper. So why do they do this? And of course, you remember back and they won't even say the word Yahweh. It's a word that cannot be spoken. And the reason they don't do that, <clears throat> and to be honest, I really respect this, is that they are afraid if they say the word God, Yahweh, and it's in a casual way, and it's not bringing glory and honor and praise to God, they say that they are breaking the third commandment, that they are taking the Lord's name in vain because they're saying, when I use God's name lightly, that's taking his name in vain. And so they will not say the word except when they are in the synagogue praying or when they are reading the scripture out loud. You know, <clears throat> we don't take names very seriously. Um, sometimes we even use names in a funny way. It was kind of a weird name I read about this week. Um, it's a family that lives out west in Arizona, and their last name is Passmore, P-A-S-S-M-O-R-E, Passmore. That, that's their name. They have a family business. <clears throat> um, they uh, sell propane gas. Uh, they sell uh, fuel oil. And so the name of their business is Passmore Gas and, and Propane. And I'm serious. That's the name of it. And it's on the side of their trucks, and it's on the big tanks, Passmore Gas. And so they use their name to get, their, get attention. And it is kind of funny, to be honest with you. And it's totally legitimate. I mean, medically speaking, that's, a, that's an appropriate statement, but they use their name in a way to get attention and to be kind of funny. And do you know today in our society, without question, the name of God is used, I'm sure, 10 times more, if not 100 times more, in curse words than it's used legitimately. Everyone, I mean, the, the, the name of God followed by a curse word or when something happens and you say, and you say the name of Jesus Christ, the, the name of our Lord and Savior. How many times have you heard that? Even on TV shows. And <clears throat> people will say, oh God, or oh my God. 
And I almost want to say, yes. I mean, what, do you want to praise him now? Should we pray? And then how about when you write OMG on your Facebook page and your texts or in an email? OMG, <clears throat> what does that stand for? Oh, my goodness, you think? Or, oh, my God. Usually most people think, oh, my God. So what if you, as a Christian, and your friends all know on your Facebook page, and you're using OMG, OMG, or you text them, OMG? They don't know. You might think in your mind, oh, I'm just saying, oh, my goodness. But in their mind, no. They think you're saying, oh, my God. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's exactly what the Orthodox Jews are afraid of. They're afraid of using God's name flippantly, unseriously, and thereby degrading the name of God. And when we use God's name, and I've even spoken to some of my grandkids about this, where from school or whatever, they'll say, oh, God. And I say, wait a minute, are you getting ready to pray? Or are we going to speak to God now? Are we going to praise him? I'm, I'm glad to do that. I said, oh, no. I said, well, you don't want to say God's name if you're not praising him, if you're not honoring him and not glorifying him. And that is something I think we need to consider and consider it seriously because it, when we use God's name casually and people know you're a Christian, then they may think, oh, it's okay to say that, OMG or my God or whatever, because so-and-so does that and she has it on her Facebook page all the time. The name of God we want to honor. The name of God we want to worship. Now, God is teaching us two things about his name as he's teaching us his name. The first point is that <clears throat> I am means I exist. I exi he existed before creation. He has been here before creation ever was created, and he will be here forever. As he said, I, this is my name forever. Every generation shall remember this name. The second thing he's pointing out that you need to understand, Yahweh is a verb. It's a verb. And he uses his name to say, I will be with you. It is a verb of action. God is active. It points to his nature, and he's involved in all of our lives at all times, even when we don't appreciate it or understand it or even see it. No matter the darkness that you see in your life, God is always there. No matter the darkness into which this world seems to be rapidly falling, God is there. No matter the darkness in your life right now, struggles that you may have, doubts that you may have, God is there. He is right with you and will be with you even when you can't see it. And he will carry out his plans and his good works that he has prepared for you before the foundation of the earth. And his plan, he will see them to completion as Paul teaches us in, in Philippians 1.6, he will complete those plans. You don't need to worry about that. It's a done deal. Just like when he told Joshua, wherever you put your foot, it's already yours. You don't need to worry. That land is yours. God's name is Yahweh. I am. His name is holy to be taken seriously never lightly. His name is eternal, and it's a verb pointing to the action in our lives and in our world, yes, even when we can't see it. But then he has some interesting plans. 
<clears throat> as we pick up in verse 16. I go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, again, the Lord, in the Bible, when you see L-O-R-D in all caps, that is Yahweh, okay? So whenever you're in your Bible, and, and, and when you look at verse 16 and gather um, the elders and say to them, the Lord, L-O-R-D, should be in all capital letters. And every time you see that, that's Yahweh. That's the name God has given himself. The Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land overflowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of, Hebrew, of the Hebrews, has met with us and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Again, Lord and Lord in that verse, Yahweh. So he has a plan. He said, now you go and you go to the elders. I never recognized this. This is, thank you, Lord. He went to the elders, and the elders back then... <clears throat> we think were the elders, meaning the older people of Israel. They were ten, typically the ones that would, would uh, be judges at the gates. They would uh, read the scroll in the, in, in the, in the re readings in the synagogue. So the elders were the older people of Israel. Elders, like in our church now, well, some of them are old, some of them aren't, but it's... it's it's really a position that is not defined by your age. But back then, it was the older folks. But I didn't realize, I mean, it, it did not sink into my brain. But these elders had a job. <clears throat> he said, you go talk to the elders. Tell them what I just told you. I'm the Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers. And then when they believed, and they were on board with Moses, and they went with Moses to the Pharaoh. I did not remember that. It did not sink into my brain. So Moses, I thought it was just Moses and Aaron that first trip to Pharaoh. No, it's all the elders supporting and believing in God with, went with Moses to the Pharaoh. And, <clears throat> and they um, went there and to say, we want to be free we want to go out into the um, land to, to worship our God. And he knew that, that Pharaoh would reject, and he knew that he would um, <clears throat> have to use a mighty hand. And that's in verse 19 I want to read. The king of Egypt will not let you go unless you are compelled by a mighty hand, so I will stretch out my hand, strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do. After that, he will let you go. So he already knew Pharaoh's heart was hardened and it was hardened so that he will show his glory and his power and then the Pharaoh will let them go. <clears throat> but he called the leaders. Now, <clears throat> we, we think that the church should be led by the pastor, and maybe, you know, a deacon or two or a Sunday school. We're all in this together, and God is using the elders in a powerful way. Now, in this church, pretty much all of you are very willing to help. Yes, our leaders, the deacons and elders, are very active in helping, like out with our events, but so are most of you. But this is to be not a burden. Oh, no, we got to outreach. I got to make some food. I have to come. You know, it shouldn't be like that. It, it, it should not be a burden.
to do things in your church, it should be a blessing. Hey, there may be some people here I don't know that I can meet and share a word of God with them or invite them to join our Sunday school class or invite them to come to our worship. It should be a joy. The elders went with Moses because they believed the word from God and they enjoyed and they went with him willingly. He didn't have to beg him to come. And that is what we should be about because this is God's church. It's not any of our churches. It's the Lord's church. And when he calls us to do something, we should all enjoy and look forward to helping out in the ministries that this church of God's carries out in this in this um, area. So that this uh, I didn't plan this. I really didn't. But this week, I don't want to hear you moaning and groaning. This is a joy. It's a joy. It's a joy. And we should look forward to our outreach and participate just like the elders did 3,500 years ago uh, in, in Egypt. God's name is Yahweh. I am. It is a holy name, an eternal name that we're to take seriously. It's a verb pointing to action in our lives and in our world. And even when we can't see it, it's working. It is a blessing, not a burden, to serve the Lord in our church and in our community. Final point, the very last verse in this section. This is really interesting too. And now, and this, and the ladies, the ladies are doing this. This is really cool. I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman, each woman shall ask her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver, gold, jewelry, and clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Normally in this time, the conquering army would plunder the country they just conquered. They, it was rather brutal. They would, there'd be a lot of killing involved, but then they would take all the riches. They would take their gold, their silver, their cattle, their sheep. They would take it. <clears throat> God said, I'm going to use your women, and they're going to get all of this plunder this gold and this silver and that's exactly what they did and you need to remember where what was this gold and silver used for yes it was used for the families and for for israel but guess what you remember the tabernacle you remember the prayer to bring in all of your uh gold and silver well that's this gold and silver this gold and silver that the Egyptians gave them was used to build the tabernacle of God. That is really interesting. And God used the women to bring about this happening. Absolutely amazing. We sometimes, as I close, we don't see God. I had a dear family who, who had lost a child, I've had several of these circumstances several years ago to cancer. And they were still struggling. They were in darkness. Where is God? Why did God not answer our prayers? And of course, they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for their baby to live. But they felt they were wandering. They were in darkness. Because the I am that's supposed to be there, they thought should have answered the prayer their way but their child did not live. And so depression, despair, darkness was their life. Their faith <clears throat> was strained. They were not talking with God much. But over months of prayer, of talking and, and exhort, exhortation, they began to see 
God again. And they, and so often is the case, you know, when you're in the midst of a loss of a loved one, you are so overwhelmed with grief and, and depression and darkness and gloom. You don't see anything. And you don't think that God is there. But after a few months, and again, of talking and praying together, God opened their eyes. And then they could look back six months later. They could look back and see, wow. Oh, there you were. I see you when this certain thing happened in the journey we were taking. Or the care that our child got and how this was a blessing and how other lives have been touched by our child. And they look back and say, oh, now I see. You are the great I am. You are here. You are with us. Even in the darkness. Even in the gloom. I am is here. And he is with you. I am is God's name. He is holy. We are to take his name seriously. And whenever we speak that word or write that word, I pray it will be to glorify and honor him. If it's not, I pray that we will not speak that name lightly. His name is eternal. His name is a verb. And it shows action in our lives and in our world, even in the darkness, even when we can't see it. He is there. God is a blessing calling us to serve Him Friday and Sundays and other events. It's a blessing and not a burden. And it's a blessing to honor the name Yahweh as we serve together in His church, in this town, in this community. It's an honor to serve the name of God. Yahweh, pray with me.